այլի բարեկամներ վերջերես նյու ջրզի ու մեր գտնվում ամերիկահայ հայտնի պաստաբան մարկիրակոսը ներկայացնելու համար իր նոր գիրկը միստրայլ։ Մենք հարցազրույց ունեցանք նրա հետ, որը սիրով ուզում եմ ներկայացնել � In mistrial, Mark Yaragos and Pat Harris debunk the myths of judges as Solomon-like figures, jurors as impartial arbitrators of the truth, and prosecutors as super-ethical heroes. Shining unprecedented light on what really goes on in the courtroom, mistrial is an enjoyable, fun look at the system that rarely lets you see behind the scenes. Mark Giragos was born in Los Angeles, California. He received his bachelor's from Haverford College and his Juris Doctor from Loyola Law School. Currently, Mr. Giragos is the managing partner at the law offices of Giragos & Giragos, a 13-person law firm in Los Angeles. Mr. Giragos handles criminal defense and civil litigation. Clients that he has represented include Michael Jackson, actress Winona Ryder, politician Gary Condit, Susan McDougall and Scott Peterson, and many other notable individuals. Mr. Giragos is considered a celebrity lawyer. An Armenian-American, Giragos maintains his close relationship with the Armenian community. He has earned praise from the Armenian National Committee of America and serves on the Advisory Committee of Birthright Armenia and is the chairman of the Armenian Bone Marrow Donor Registry. He has been a member of the Armenia Fund USA International Board of Trustees since 2006. Recently, Mr. Giragos spoke forcefully on CNN against baseless accusations that an individual of Armenian descent was somehow involved or was connected to the Boston Marathon bombings. Way, as an Armenian, I do want to comment that all of this speculation about some recent convert named Misha, which, by the way, is not an Armenian name, um, is insulting to Armenians everywhere, who, by the way, is the first Christian nation. So rather than have some uncle on who passes for somebody who knows what he's talking about, who hasn't seen this guy in three years, I think we should be a little bit more critical with some of the information that's being passed around as gospel at this point. Right, and, and uh, Wolf, uh, actually in the interview with the uncle, uh, it, it did come out that that uncle has not seen these kids, or these kids, these, these adults, uh, the, these young men, uh, as you said, in two to three years. In two to three so years. How, you know, I mean, he, he's, right. he's been... And all of a sudden, he's all of a sudden insulting Armenians everywhere as if there's some Armenian convert to Muslim. I mean, re remember the Armenians, and this week, the Armenians celebrated the 19, 98th commemoration of the genocide, where 1.5 Christian Armenians were wiped out by Muslim Ottoman Turks. So the idea that there's some convert from Christianity to Muslim who's, who's doing this, who doesn't even have an Armenian name, is ludicrous to begin with. Um, they, somebody needs to give this uncle a field sobriety test, because I think this guy was under the influence of something. <laughs> Mark, thank you so much for this interview. Um, before we begin our conversation about this fascinating book, I actually want to uh, start our interview with the recent events that took place when um, there's been these allegations, or ridiculous allegations, that someone of an Armenian descent who has actually converted to, uh, to Muslim somehow has been involved in a, a recent... In, the, in, in a bust... In, in Boston. Absolutely. I, there's a video that's gone viral. Um, I was on CNN lambasting how utterly ridiculous this is. I mean, first of all, it's insulting to Armenians who were the first Christian nation. We've been persecuted because of our Christian beliefs for, you know, going on 1,700 years. You combine that with this allegation comes out, and a ludicrous allegation, during the week in which we commemorate at the 98th uh, anniversary of the genocide. And then this idea that somehow his name is Misha and he must be Armenian. I mean, virtually every Armenian I know has never met somebody named Misha who was Armenian. Yeah. Um, it's now come out and, there, and uh, this uncle who supposedly made this allegation um, even called to apologize to, to, uh, to Armenians. Um, 
I obviously to me um, there's a lot more than meets the eye and I think it was um, a shameful that it was reported the way it was in the mainstream media. And people who don't know much about Armenians or Armenian culture or Armenian history or religion for that matter of fact would then begin to make accusations that are incorrect. Now my next follow-up question about this subject as well, in your opinion as a community, as Armenian community here in the United States and worldwide, should we continue pressing on this subject? Should we continue contacting CNN? Should, should we continue explaining to everyone that this has been an, a ridiculous and ludicrous mistake to do something like this? Well, I think, I, I think any time you can speak up and say something, you should. I've, I, I've always said one of the things that um, I counsel people of the generation that is younger is, look, you can always talk amongst ourselves. One of the problems we have as Armenians, we're always preaching to the choir. We're always talking to ourselves. We're always giving speeches to Armenians, okay? Out of our right. <laughs> what the, you know, that's fine. That's great. It's great for cheerleading. I understand it. But go out, be successful in the world. You know, not just in your Armenian community, in the world. And then you can have some gravitas. You can have some a voice that's going to be heard outside of our own community. Otherwise, this is, uh, you know, it's a fool's errand that we're on. You know, and, and it, uh, your answer directly leads me to the to the book because before we start a conversation about what uh, what the book is is about is in essence, um, there are a few interesting points that attracted my attention when I was reading it. First of all, uh, of course, everybody knows you as a very successful attorney and celebrity attorney, but it turns out to be this was not an easy decision for you, and uh, you uh, followed some. Um, you wanted to be in entertainment, you wanted to be in anthropology, and amazingly, you wanted actually to, to even follow a clergy and become a clergyman. And then, and then you had a very interesting conversation with an Armenian priest when you needed advice. Please tell us that story. The um, I grew up um, in one week a year. I always call myself a shish kebab Armenian. I would go to um, Armenian summer camp, the Western Diocese summer camp, and I have very fond memories of that, and I became very close to um, Surpazan uh, Vache, and uh, I would talk to him uh, periodically when I would come back, and when I was in college, I, had, uh, be, I kind of rekindled an interest in the philosophy of religion, and that was a minor of mine. And I, one of my professors there was going to, uh, had been offered and was going to go to the divinity, one of the Ivy League divinity schools, and I was thinking of following him there and becoming, uh, going into the clergy. I talked to the Serpazan, and the Serpazan said, not for you. We need you to be, we can use you more as a lawyer than we can as a clergyman, and that, had, that stuck with me, and I took, the, I took that road, if you will. Yes. Of course, we are very glad, and I'm sure you are very glad that you have taken I, uh, you have taken that road. It's, it's all in this. I was an <laughs> I don't know. It's all in this book. Um, there's another very interesting point that I quickly want to uh, 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 discuss with you. Um, you had obviously many choices to go in many fields in in, in law, but you choose to be uh, an attorney, a trial attorney. And one of the connections that you make in this book is because you are Armenian and because we've been prosecuted and because we have this kind of a defensive quality to us because of our history, your, the choice was obvious. It's a very interesting connection. Can you elaborate a little bit yeah, on that? I think that there is something in the DNA of Armenians which, uh, where we gravitate to, because of persecution, to feeling some empathy for the underdog. And at least I always have. In fact, I always will uh, tell the, uh, being raised as an Armenian, I, what, one of the things that always bothered me is it seems like we'd always talk about our heroes, our Armenian heroes and Armenian wars, and we were always losing. We were always getting our Vodigs kicked. Um, and I always found that to be a, an awful position, but I, we understood it. Then, you know, to, now we're looking at 20 years since Nagor Kharapa, which is an amazing victory. It's an amazing, it's an amazing it's victory. It's still, well, it should be, it's a much. success story that should be incorporated into the narrative that we tell. We do not tell and embrace that narrative enough. We should be marketing, frankly, the idea that here this tiny little Christian nation surrounded by hostilities was able to overcome better funded, better equipped um, uh, Islamic uh, fanatics so that they could create a, a little island of democracy um, and Christian democracy in a sea of hostility. I mean, that is a wonderful narrative. And that links back to what I say. I like the idea of these overwhelming odds 
which generally is either the government or corporations or things of that nature, and being able to represent individuals against some seemingly unsurmountable odds. That, that drew me to what I do now, whether it's plaintiffs litigation, suing large corporations, insurance companies, the government, or defending an individual who's accused of a crime against the unbelievably awesome power of the federal government. Yeah. You know, just to quickly to talk about Nagorno-Karabakh since you brought it up, uh, I had an interview with a U.S. ambassador, and uh, he, he said that the U.S. goal is to promote uh, American or Western values in a region. And I mentioned to him that, in fact, this little land is a success story of promoting Western value because it's a true government representative of the people, and it's a true democracy. But and it didn't cost us tens of billions of dollars a month to go invade some country or anything else. This is a country of, frankly, ragtag, self-starting, uh, principled Armenians, Christian uh, Armenians, who decided to go over there and take what was rightfully theirs and do it against all odds. And that is amazing. And, you know, we, uh, we don't even ask for more than a drop of the bucket at this point. All we're asking for is recognition. Recognition. And that's, you know, that's part of the problem with the Armenians, whether it's recognition of the genocide, recognition of the Gorakarapa. You know, we got to stop saying we want recognition and move to a new R word, which is restitution, yes. reparations. I mean, the government should be writing us, the U.S. government should be writing us a check. U.S. government, instead of kowtowing to Turkey and having Air Force bases in Ankara, put your Air Force bases into Armenia, put your Air Force bases into uh, nagorno karabakh or you open up the trade there. Recognize that, they, that this is something, that's a, it's not an experiment in democracy, it's a working example of democracy. Yeah. And I, I do want to talk to you about recognition and retribution, for that matter of fact, a little bit further down. But you know, to come back to the book, um, I, re I was very uh, attracted from the idea of why you decided to write this book. Because obviously, you are very successful a professional. You have over 300 cases. You are a world-known uh, attorney. And then somewhere in a cigar bar, somebody approaches and gives you these ridiculous accusations. And you say, this is the time. Please well, tell I us the story. I've had a... Um, for years, people have asked to write a book, and I've always said no. And then, as you say, in the book we write about, I was sitting in a cigar bar in Manhattan and with the co-author, Pat, and some guy came up to us and started giving us all kinds of grief. He had recognized us, and, and how do you defend these people, and how do you do this, and how do you do that? And it just went on and on and on. And I'm just trying to watch the Laker game. And finally, I turned to the guy and said, well, what is it that you do for a living? And the guy says, well, I'm a, I'm a civil litigator. He's a, he's a lawyer. I said, I turned to Pat and I said, if the lawyers don't get what it is that is the, what we're, we're doing, then maybe it is time to write a book. And that's why we decided to do it. Yeah. It's a fascinating book, aside from the fact that you have these fascinating cases that you are discussing. And obviously, they are very entertaining and they're very educational, for that matter of fact. You're taking a very serious take on a legal system in the United States with all of its shortcomings, including that the judges that are completely uh, focused on being reelected, including the cops that are corrupt, for lack of other word, including the jury that have a self-interest in being in this jury box so they can make a profit down the line and so forth. Um, why did you decide to, it's an expose in many ways, why did you decide to do it at this stage of your career, right well, now? I, I think that in a lot of ways, uh, the, the pendulum has swung too much to where I see government abuse, I see kind of the makings of totalitarian government control, and that worries me. I mean, the greatest thing that we have going for us in America, the single greatest thing, I think, is the jury system. The ability of jurors to kind of be the last bulwark against government abuse. And I think um, that what has happened over the last 30 years is there's been the slow erosion of civil, liber civil liberties in America. And I think somebody needed to say it or speak power, uh, speak truth to power, and that's uh, kind of the motivation for it. How do you control media? Because the presumption of innocence goes, goes out of the door before the trial even begins because people already have an opinion. And how do you keep the jury uh, unaffected? How do you control that? It's uh, an extremely difficult task. I mean, anybody who says you can control the media, I think, is a fool's errand. I don't think you ever control the media. But I think what you have to do is you have to understand that media does have an effect. And it has not a, just an effect on the jurors. It has an effect on the judge. In fact, I jokingly say that besides sequestering jurors, I, even more so, I'd rather sequester judges. Uh, because I think that judges have to, unfortunately, in a lot of states, the system is designed that they have to worry about re-election. And if you're worrying about the next popular vote, being a judge and making a correct decision may be unpopular. 
and people don't understand that. Politicians manipulate the system for their own re-election as well. You don't want judges to be politicians. You want judges to judge. You don't want the tyranny of the majority. I mean, that's what the Founding Fathers designed this system on. When people talk about getting someone off on a technicality, that always cracks me up. I mean, that technicality the that they're talking about, it's called the Constitution. That was what we fought f uh, for. That's what we continue to fight for is the Constitution. So when people say, uh, you know, that they want to do this or they want to do that or they don't want uh, somebody shouldn't defend somebody or the system shouldn't work, they're, they're tinkering with a document that well might be one of the single greatest inventions of man, which is the U.S. Constitution. And that's not something to be trivialized. Um, it's interesting that one of the driving forces for you to, 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 dry, to write this book was the comment that was made in a cigar bar that, oh, you guys are just you know, representing rich people, and you know, the, the, the question of morality was obscured. But of course, it's f far from being the truth. In fact, you represent a wide variety of people, and in fact, you do a large pro bono work. Tell us about the scope of your work. Tell us about your interests. I, I often will say, that we have what I call a Robin Hood practice. For those who don't remember Robin Hood, he was the either mythical or historical character who would take from the rich and give to the poor. In a kind of similar vein, um, the celebrity or the well-heeled clients subsidize what I call uh, our, our less well-heeled clients. And, Fully 70% of the practice are people who normally could not afford the kind of defense or take on the kind of plaintiff's litigation or take on the insurance companies that we do. And so we do a balance between that. Um, one of the other things over the years, the last 20 years, is with the exodus, for lack of a better term, of Armenians post the breakup of the Soviet Union, being in Los Angeles, which is now the, in Glendale specifically, the, the highest concentration of Armenians outside of Yerevan, unfortunately there is um, a lot of interaction with the government. And there's a lot of Armenians who are constantly getting arrested and kind of churning through the system. So for the last 20 years, a large, you know, maybe 25% of my practice has been representing Armenians who are in trouble and trying to navigate them through the system and, uh, and help them out. And that was also one of the reasons that we started the genocide uh, litigation and have become, I think, successful with doing that as well. Well, thank you very much for this interview. It's been absolutely fascinating. Thank and uh, please purchase the book. It's a fascinating read. And uh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you again. You. I appreciate it.